Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37. Let's go to God's word. We are beginning a brand new series entitled, What to Do in a Valley. How to Navigate Life's Valleys. And I believe that God has a word in the house. And I want to tell you, I am only as good of a preacher as you are a listener. And so if you'll give me an amen once in a while, if you'll give me a, a Baptist nod every once in a while, if you'll give me a Catholic cough every once in a while, if you'll give me a Pentecostal wave every once in a while, if you'll give me a charismatic stank face, we're going to have some church, all right? If you sit there like the frozen chosen, I'm going to be here all day and you won't eat because I'll just keep preaching. So can I get a good, a good little amen? All right, we ready? Okay. Great to see Luke and Chella Rayford here from Texas. They left us, but the Lord's going to call them home. Amen. Uh, but they, they, they were day ones uh, with us and uh, have moved on to Dallas. And, uh, but we love you guys and, uh, and miss you. And then I don't know where he's at, but Brian Reese. Hey, there you are. Uh, Brian Reese pastors in Seattle. And uh, they're here on vacation trying to get some sunshine. Amen. And uh, I love you guys so much. Thanks for being in church today celebrating. They, they've got a absolute move of God happening up in Seattle. How many know Seattle needs Jesus? Amen. Amen. And so, uh, so, so grateful. Unlike Dallas. Amen. Uh, Seattle needs, <laughs> I just tease it. I just got, got to get the salty out of me real quick. Okay, okay, I'm ready to go. No, but we love you guys. Celebrate you, what God's doing. Ezekiel 37. And they, by the way, they were so excited about our building. Uh, they sent a gift of $10,000 to <laughs> us. Isn't that amazing? So we love you guys so much. Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. That was a very churchy way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You, I don't know. Then he said to me, prophesy to the bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, make flesh come upon you, cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So verse that this is so powerful. So I prophesied as I was commanded. I want you to notice that that. When you're in a valley, when you're in a challenge, when you're in a fight, when you're facing giants, it is so important to say what God says. Pro prophets are not just future predictors. Prophets are not what you see on TikTok talking about the, um, the solar eclipse tomorrow that is supposedly a really big deal because all the other eclipses weren't, but tomorrow's is because now we have TikTok. That's not prophecy. That's conspiracy theory. And it's idiots. As, as, if, as if America is the center of Bible prophecy. It's the most American thing ever. It's like, of course, everything that's happening in America is significant. Not, you know. I love him. I'm a big America guy. Big, big guy. Big America guy. I just, I, I refuse to force America into the text. But keep TikToking, okay? And uh, go viral. Go viral. You go viral. Um, what if you're wrong? Then I guess we get out of here. I don't know. <laughs> and I'll be so embarrassed. Like, I'll be embarrassed for, like, I'll have to go to God and be like, God, you let the TikTokers? <laughs> I know you use the foolish things of the world, but the TikTokers? So, so someone said, uh, so I just got a rant for a second. Um, someone said, the eclipse is going to go right over Noah's Ark in Kentucky. And Jesus said, as in the days of Noah. I went, man, I don't know what you're smoking, but I would love it <laughs> if I could get whatever you're on. I feel like my life would be better because you're connecting a you're connecting a museum in Kentucky to the last days. You are some kind of special. 
<laughs> just in case anyone's wondering about my theology, I'm just, just defending all the new people who are back from Easter last week. You're like, well, not this guy. Okay. So he said, prophesy, and I prophesied. What was I talking about? John 3, 16. Okay, here we go. Verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me, breath entered them. They came to life, stood up on their feet, a vast army. Verse 11, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them. This is what the sovereign Lord says, my people. I'm going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. Just, just look at verse one and two again. He, the scripture said, the hand of the Lord was on me. Oh. And he was with me. And he led me back and forth. And I saw, I saw, I saw. I was able to see now that God was with me. Let's talk about it just a couple of minutes. God is with you in the valley. God is with you in the valley. Look at your neighbor say, God is with you. And I'm with you. So you're going to win. Come on, tell them you're going to win. You're going you're gonna to win. God is speaking to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. They have, they have been led out of Egypt. They are in their wilderness and they're now about to enter their promised land. And God speaks to them about their promised land. God speaks to them about their destiny. God speaks to them about the promised place that he has for them. And he says, you, you just need to know that your life, Deuteronomy 11.11, 11, the land you will possess, the, the place in which you live, will have hills and valleys. That your life is going to have some mountaintops, and some valley lows, that there are going to be some really incredible high moments and there will be some low moments, that just settle, settle right now. It's not that if you just had enough faith, you will always live on the mountain. No, that, that's, that's, that's not the Bible. The, the Bible is a, a life of hills and Valleys that, yes, there will be milk and honey. There will be a land flowing with milk and honey. There will be vineyards you won't have to plant and houses you won't have to build and wells you won't have to dig. Yes, let's go. Oh, and there will be giants. <laughs> and there will be enemies. And there will be, pe I'm giving you the land, uh, but they're not gonna wanna give it up easily. And so there, there will always be a fight over your promise. There will be highs and lows. There will be ups and downs. There will be victories and battles. See, we, we, we cheer about Romans 8 that I'm more than a conqueror. But if I'm more than a conqueror, that means I got to conquer something. So let me just settle in our hearts. There are no valley-free lives. If I just read more of the Bible, and if I just prayed more, and if I just spoke in tongues more, I would never go through anything. I would just float through life. And that is not the picture of Scripture. <laughs> so I've learned to be encouraged in the valley, to see God in the valley, and to grow in the valley. Because I've learned that there is no fruit on the mountain. All you health nuts, go climb Mount Everest. You're going to find snow and dead bodies and nothing else. <laughs> There's no life up there. there. It's not sustainable. The river flows in the valley. The fruit is in the valley. The life is in the valley. The provision is in the valley. The rain falls down into the valley. There's only fruit in the valley. Jabin, it almost seems like you like the valley. No, I don't like it, but I've had to learn to embrace it. Because within every challenge and blessing in my life, I have a decision to make. Am I going to trust God? Or am I going to get mad at God? Or am I going to forget God? So I got good news. You're not going to die in the valley. The valley is a season, not a life. The valley is a moment of challenge. It's not your everyday experience. But it is important that you allow God to do a work in you in the valley, so that then God can do a work 
through you in the valley. Because see, that's, it doesn't end with Ezekiel. It ends with life. It ends with, with national transformation. It, it ends with a people coming back to life. It, it, it ends with ministry, but it begins in the valley. When you're in it, you hate it. When you're in it, you think it's the devil. When you're in it, you're rebuking it. When you're in it, you're saying, God, where are you? And then you get on the other side of it and you go, oh, there was God. There was God. There was God. See, we sing songs on Sunday that we don't believe on Monday. We sing a song called Waymaker on Sundays. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. And on Monday, you're going, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But every time you pass a test, you get to the other side, you look back and you go, I see God now. God's hand was on me. God was with me. I didn't feel it, couldn't sense it, couldn't hear him, but he was all around. So the valley is, watch this, the uncomfortable place where God stretches us, enlarges us, and this is a big part, and reveals himself to us. Okay, so num number one, when, when you're in the valley, you have to remember God's hand. Remember God's hand. The hand of the Lord is upon me. Even when I let go, God doesn't let go. Even when I run, God chases me. The hand of the Lord is upon me. You are not alone. God is with you. God's hand is not let go of you. The resistance doesn't prove that God has left you. The resistance proves that there is victory on the other side. God is with you and God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? So the great theologian from the 1600s, John Knox, said this. He said, a man with God or a woman with God is always in the majority. That if I got God, I got possibilities. <laughs> if I got God, there's a way. If I, if I, got, if I got God, I've got options. I may be in a valley of dry bones right now. It may feel like I'm surrounded by death right now. It might feel like I'm surrounded by a graveyard right now. But God is with me in this. And I refuse to let the resistance <laughs> discourage me. The fight does not prove I'm alone. The fight proves I'm going in the right direction. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Which means the, the church is moving forward. Hell is fighting against us, but the gates, the defense of hell cannot prevail against the church. So if you ever hit a wall, it just means that you're going in the right direction. See, the enemy wants to discourage you in the dry place. He wants, to, he wants you to focus in on the bones, on the death, on the, on the what was. But you won't die in the valley. David said it like this, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Watch all this hand language. I said the hand of the Lord is upon me. Watch all this hand language. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint, that's another hand gesture. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth. That means you're pouring out the wine of the Holy Spirit, the, the joy and the peace and the contentment of the Holy Spirit, even while I'm in this, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell, watch this, I don't dwell in the valley, I don't live in the valley, I don't die in the valley, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can I tell you that this season will come to an end, that there are better days for you, let God anoint you. Let God fight for you. Let God, let goodness and mercy follow you. Can we take a praise break real quick? Come on, I need somebody to. You're not dying in this. So, so when I'm in the valley, I got to know God's with me. Number two, I got to seek God's direction. Remember God's hand, but secondly, seek God's direction. Watch what he does. God brought me out and God led me. 
It's right there, verse 1 and 2. God brought me out and God led me. Here's why I say seek God's direction. Because when you're in the challenge, watch this, watch, watch, watch. You want out. Can I get an honest saint in the house? That just, like you, you just want out. Where's the exit? <laughs> when you're in it, you want relief. And you must desire the will of God over relief. See, so when you're single, you just want a spouse. You just want, you just don't want another lonely Friday night. You just want, so what do you do? You settle. You know there's something worse than, than, than being single, right? It's marrying the wrong person. <laughs> Are there wrong people? Yeah, I met a lot of them. So yeah, there are wrong people. <laughs> but you're lonely. You, you need God's direction, not relief. By the way, here's the flip of that. You get married, you get married and marriage gets a little cold. You want relief. You, what, what, you need, what you need to do is stay and fight and hear from God. Right. What you need to do is throw blows and yell a little bit right. and then pray it out and make up, amen, and, and maybe get a little counseling and maybe whatever you got to do, get some good people in your life to help you. But maybe, maybe it's not just relief. How do I get out of it? Work is challenging. Hey, you need a new job. <laughs> Boss is a jerk. Need a new job. I'm not having a lot of fun at work. I guess I need a new job. I guess God's, no, no. Maybe, you're, maybe that manager is terrible, and maybe if you'll stick it out, you can become the manager. A lot of you don't prosper because you've just had too many jobs. You have to keep starting over. You can't even get raises. I'm believing to be a kingdom billionaire. You, you've been at 40 grand for 10 years. Because you just keep quitting. Oh, man. You know what? Let's go to, let's go to point three. You don't want to hear point two. <laughs> Ain't nobody here for point two. I, I'm telling I've had to live this. I, I'm 40. I'm telling you, I've had to live that. I've had to live that. Where I want out, but what I need is God. Well, Vegas is windy. I get, you know, maybe it's time to move on to another. Well, yeah, it is windy a couple. Of, yeah, yeah, just relax, chill. <laughs> well, it's been raining a lot. Maybe there's global, you know, there's changes in the weather. I guess we need to, no, just, it's just rainy. We, went, we had a long drought. Now it's, there's a little bit of rain, chill. <laughs> I, I'm just, here's what I'm amazed at. I'm amazed at the amount of people I've seen in my life over, over all these years who have created created signs to, to, to give them the permission to leave the valley too soon. Signs aren't bad. Signs are, are, can be from God, and God does speak. But listen, Jesus said a wicked generation looks, seeks for a sign. If, if I challenge you today, on your way home, look for white cars, you will find white cars. And if you're looking for a sign, you will, you will find a sign. I don't seek signs. I seek God. All right, so, so, so I'm talking to a friend this week, a young, a young preacher this week who's in a little bit of a transition. And I said, Here, here's my prayer for you. I said, you're not going to like this prayer. This prayer is offensive. This prayer, this, this prayer is going to, you're not going to like this prayer. But it's from the Bible. And there's some Bible prayers we just don't pray. But here's a, here's a Bible prayer. The Apostle Paul is praying for the church in Colossae. They are, Colossi, they, are, they are persecuted. They are going through different battles, different valleys, different storms. And here is Paul's prayer. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have a miracle. No, that way, no, no. <laughs> breakthrough 2024, no. And that's our word for the year. I believe in breakthrough. I believe in miracles. I, I'm, I need some miracles right now. But while I'm waiting on my miracle, please hear me, church. While I'm waiting on my miracle, I need endurance, the worst Bible word in the Bible. It's worse than hell, amen. <laughs> 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 
or it's right there. And by the way, and number two, and patience. That's Paul's prayer. Can you imagine me in the church at Colossians? You're waiting for this letter from your apostle, the pastor of the church of the Colossians. He gets the letter. He goes, all right, Paul's written to us. It's going to be great. Let's believe God for a miracle. I'm praying for your endurance. Can we get a new apostle? Where's Peter? Where's John? Where's Jude? Somebody call Thomas. Is Judas still available? Oh, no, no. Okay, well. Endurance? Most of your life, you will not need miracles for most of your life. For most of your life, you'll need endurance. Most of your life, you will not need breakthroughs. Most of your life, you'll need patience. Watch this. And what's the result? What, are the, what is the ingredients for joy? Patience and endurance. You know that a lot of you have never experienced real joy. Because you've never endured. You don't get to experience the joy until you've endured. You, 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 you only get happiness, which is the result of happenings. So if everything's good, you're good. But joy is deep and eternal and real. And it only comes from endurance and from patience. I told you you were going. I, I told that to, to this young preacher, and he goes, I'm offended. I'm mad at Paul. <laughs> he said, I never read that scripture. I said, no, you have. I said, but the last time you read Colossians, you just read over verse 11 because. <laughs> so endurance is when your faith outlasts the temptation and the trial, the frustration and the season you're currently in. That's endurance. The temptation hits you. You endure. You don't give in. You endure. The next time the temptation comes, it will be weaker and you will be stronger. Some of you men are looking at pornography and you're going, man, I need deliverance. So you need endurance. You need to feel the temptation and then endure. And the next time you feel it, it won't be as strong. And the next time you feel it, it'll even be weaker. And by four or five, in, in just a couple of weeks, you'll be like disgusted that you ever even did that. Your endurance grows. And the temptation gets weaker. The, the frustration is there. The, 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 the temptation for bitterness or for unforgiveness or the trials or the frustration is there or the season you're in. And what you do is you outlast the moment. And God gives you the endurance to outlast it and the patience. Watch this. Patience is just having faith for a long time. And Paul prays that. And, and listen, if Paul prayed it, you can pray it. Well, don't pray for patience or God might just give you something to be patient about. Now, you have a million reasons. You don't, God's not gonna. People are so dumb, man. People. Oh. I just want to just choke people sometimes. God, God needs to give me endurance, amen, and patience. Can you tell I'm on a, I'm on a frustration with all these tick-tuckers? Because <laughs> they ain't pastors. They ain't in the real world. They're just in their studio talking to cameras. Watch this. If you ask God for patience, he's not going to give you a terrible situation to teach you patience. You need it. You, you just need it about life. You need it. You need it to go to Walmart. You need endurance to go to Target. You need... I got chewed out today at Starbucks by the Starbucks worker. No, I got chewed out. Six in the morning. Not a soul awake in Las Vegas at 6 a.m. besides our loading team. Oh, give it up for our loaded team. And I ordered my coffee, but I accidentally ordered it to walk in to pick it up. Not for the drive-thru, but I, but I, walked, I, I drove up and there was nobody in the drive-thru. So I go, hi, my name's Jamin, I have a mobile order. She goes, is it for the drive-thru? <laughs> no, it's for inside, I think I made a mistake. <sighs> Through the, I could smell her breath through the speaker. 
I got my patience. I'm like, I got to preach, Holy Ghost, if you could just help me not lose my testimony. I pull up, hi, good morning. Yeah, so see, it's just really important that if you're going to order, and she starts going in, holding my coffee hostage. She's got a pepper spray in one hand and my coffee in the other. She's like, it's really, like, how are you going to act, sucker, you know? And she goes, because they go to different lines. I go, I, I couldn't help it. I couldn't. I just got to confess my sin. I just got to confess. Y'all, forgive me. I, I said, that, that table right there, that's three feet from you. Is, is that well, the one? I took that coffee. And I said, you are invited to my church. I go to that Mormon church right over. I peeled out. God, give me endurance. No, I didn't. I said, thanks so much. I'll remember that. <laughs> Crank the worship music. God, make me a Christian again. Quick, I got to preach. Listen, if you will ask for patience, watch this. God will grant you the patience that you need so that your next move isn't the wrong move. You, you need patience before transition. <sighs> mm. So when you're hurting, I've said this a thousand times, when you're hurting, when you're frustrated, when you're tempted, when you're discouraged, do not add to your life. Wait. I would rather be late in the will of God than early out of the will of God. From, from the time the Lord spoke to us about moving here to plant this church, it was about an 18-month process. And the first six months of that were me rebuking my, I mean, it was, it was a nightly prayer. You could ask my wife. It was every night I would leave for two hours and I would go walk and I would pray and I'd go, God, is this you? Is this me? Is this my pride? Is, what, what is going on with me? What's happening with me? Are you leading us? And for six months I wrestled until I finally really felt like the Lord was leading me. I'm just saying, patience. Uh, Goldie right now will ask for something. My, my little seven-year-old, she'll go, Dad, can I, have, can I have a snack? Nah, not right now. We're going to eat dinner soon. Please. Nah, we're going to eat dinner soon. Please. <laughs> now nah, we're going to eat dinner pretty soon. Please. <laughs> now nah, we're going to eat dinner pretty soon. And then, she, and then she'll come grab me. Now we're going to eat dinner pretty soon. <laughs> and, then she, and then she shifts. You know what I'm saying? You know when your kid gets that like cat face. <laughs> I go, the canines come out. They grow nails. They, ah, you know, like, oh, you little feral little alley cat. All of, all, of her, all of her requests, all of her pleas is not a sign of faith. It's a sign of immaturity. You, I'm just telling you, you got to seek God's direction. Just wait, just wait. I've only, I've only had to make a few major moves in my life because I've been willing to wait. So there's, there's less change. Thirdly, receive God's vision. So, so watch this. He's, he's in the valley. But he embraces God's hand. He sees God's presence. He, he embraces that God's with him in the valley. He settles. He lets God lead him. He lets God guide him. And now, watch this. And I saw. I saw in the spirit realm. Oh, this is so powerful. We're talking about vision, not eyesight. We're talking about he's now able to see what he's never seen before. Vision is born in the waiting. Ezekiel now sees in the spirit and is able to see God's view. He's no longer seeing in the natural, but in the spiritual. He now has a vision. He now has a God picture. 
I want to, I want to say this. I, I've been walking with God for 25 years, full-time ministry for 20 years. I can say this. I, I have had seasons where it's, it's some kind of resistance, some kind of valley, some kind of, and then it's making the choice to patiently trust God, and then it's sudden breakthrough. It's like, boom, my eyes open. And all of a sudden I can see in 3D and I have the word of the Lord and I have, and, and it's that pattern. And then I live in that vision and I live in that word from God. And I, and I live in what the Holy Spirit has said to me. In the Old Testament, the prophets were called seers. S-E-E-R-S, seers. They were able to see into the spirit realm. They didn't live by their natural eyesight alone, but they were able to see what God was doing. God would constantly call on the prophets and he would say, Ezekiel, what do you see? Jeremiah, what do you see? Isaiah, what do you see? Elijah, what do you see? Once they were settled enough, they could now see what God was doing. I don't know if you've ever turned out the lights and when you first turn off the lights, it's pitch black. But then what happens? Your, your eyes grow accustomed. And now you, now you, you kind of have night vision. You kind of. I am cooking. I, I heard that. Someone said, you're cooking. I am cooking. If, if you'll settle, you'll see. So I don't, I don't mean settle like, like give up and, and, and just settle for less. I'm talking about when you'll settle your spirit and you'll just calm down. You'll begin to see. This is what happened in 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha is surrounded by an enemy. And his servant comes and says, Elisha, we're surrounded by enemies. Elisha's prayer is for his servant. God, open his eyes. Not these eyes. Open his spiritual eyes to see that there are more for us than there are against us. And when... They say amen to their prayer. Gehazi, the servant, opens his eyes and he realizes that the enemy that was surrounding them was surrounded by God. That angels had surrounded them, that there were more for them than there were against them. It it was not that they had an enemy problem, he had a vision problem. You don't have a devil problem, you got a vision problem. You don't got a money problem, you got a vision problem. You don't have a marriage problem, you got a vision problem. God opened my eyes to see this how you see it. I need somebody to say amen to this preacher right now. I'm I'm preaching. And when I get my word from God, I'm now sustained. Without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision, people perish. Proverbs 29, verse 18, without a vision, people perish. This is not a, a, a word vision that means eyesight. It means prophetic insight. It, it's not eyesight, it's insight. It's the ability to see from God's point of view. It's, it's, every, it's every dad in this room that took your kids to Disneyland and the parade started and you were late to the parade. So you grab that little three or four year old and you throw them on your shoulders and you stand tall and they're able to see what they couldn't see before. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do for you. He will pick you up and he will throw you on his shoulders and he will say, look. Oh my God, I feel this word right now. And if you'll be patient long enough, you will see sure enough. I'm looking at my clock, and I'm looking at my sermon, and I'm in trouble. <laughs> let, me just, let me just give you this really quick. Hebrews, Hebrews 11, 23. By faith. Everybody say, by faith. By faith. Watch this. By, by faith, Moses' parents hit him uh, after he was born. Watch this. Because they saw. By, by faith, they saw. By faith, they saw. He's no ordinary child. He wasn't ordinary. Yeah, he was actually e- extremely ordinary. It, it was not that Moses was special. It was that his parents had faith. Maybe, 
maybe it had more to do with Moses' parents than it had to do with Moses. Or maybe, maybe there are no ordinary children. Maybe, maybe every person is born with a beautiful spark and gift from God. But, but not everybody has the faith to see it. Moses the stutterer, Moses, Moses the murderer, Moses the coward, Moses the, the weak guy that wouldn't even circumcise his kids because he was so afraid of his wife and God almost killed him. Mo Moses was... Well, he also had a little bit of pride. At the end of his life, he's writing his own autobiography and he goes, there's never been a man more humble than Moses. He's the greatest prophet who ever lived. I'm like, okay, Moses. I don't know... If I have you ever seen a kid with great parents? They just think they're awesome. <laughs> they think they can sing, dance, play sports. They think they can do anything. Because they're, they're feeding on the faith of their, par of, of their parents. Let me, I just, I maybe just, I, I'm not trying to brag on me or my delusional child, but let me just say this. We bought a piano. And for a couple of weeks, Goldie just went and banged on the piano. And after a couple of weeks, I said, We're, we've hired a music teacher, a piano teacher. She's going to teach you how to play piano. And Goldie said, Dad, I know how to play piano. <laughs> I just, uh, here, here's what I'm getting at. By faith, she could, she could play by faith. Amen. <laughs> What, here's what, she was speaking out of my faith. By faith they saw, and by faith you can see. See, with these eyes I see the mountain, but with these eyes I see the God who can move the mountain. With these eyes I see the sickness, but with these eyes I see Jehovah, my healer. With, with, with these eyes, I see my, my current financial situation, but with these eyes, I see Jehovah Jireh, my provider. With these eyes, I see my children that are not currently serving God, but with these eyes, I, I see that me and my whole household shall be saved. With, with these eyes, I see a marriage that, that is a little cold right now, but with these eyes, I see a family that will serve God together. I'm not in denial of my mountain. I'm talking to my mountain. And I'm not seeing my mountain with these eyes. I'm seeing my mountain with these eyes. And these eyes tell me, mountain, you got to be uprooted and cast into the sea. I'm not crazy. I'm not delusional. But now that I've hold on to God, i got a vision. And I'm able to see what I could not see. I'm able to say what I could. Come on, somebody. Say. And I'm going to have what I could not have. Because I held on to God in the valley. Can we give God a thunderous shout of praise in the house? Everybody stand. We're almost done. Everybody stand. You're not dismissed, but please stand. <laughs> Just close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, would you lift your hands Father, I pray for my friends. I pray that you give them endurance to outlast every fiery arrow of the enemy, to outlast every temptation of their flesh, to outlast the discouragement of the season they're in. Grant us endurance and patience so that we may walk in the supernatural joy of the Lord. Oh God, we know that you have a promised land for us. We know that you've got a land flowing with milk and honey. We know that you've got good things, but God help us to navigate the hills.